do we is so there, I'm assuming there's no language then that we can get some of that money back and the company has already received a tax break help me to understand that piece the way this is written right now the revocation of the certificate comes only <coughs> if the company does not invest 100 million dollars on that singular point yeah. yes the but in order but the credit language says in order to receive a credit they have to have already invested a hundred million dollars so they're not going to have gotten a credit if they are in a position of having their certificate revoked because it'll only be revoked if they haven't if they have not invested the 100 million but they only get the credit if they have invested it so they will not have received any credit to be recaptured if a certificate is being revoked now you could change that standard if you want you know to change the conditions for revocation of a certificate um, if you wanted to use numbers of employees or anything else to say that it would be re revoked um, after at some point after they had started receiving credits but the amount of investment as the only standard for revocation at this point would mean that there would be no credits granted before there was a revocation. So there would be nothing to recapture. Representative Grant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I think I just want to double check the light bulb just went on um, on this issue. I've been the one sort of working that issue like a dog with a bone, if you will. So um, I think I can clarify your question. I was concerned about a clawback provision. Um, but the fact is, the claw, there's only a revocation of the certification if the investment isn't made. There's a separate um, piece here on the decelerated credit if the, if the um, labor levels drop. And so that's handled differently than the revocation. So <clears throat> the credit's been given for the investment, and there is no need to have a clawback on unless you wanted to m mess with the other pieces of this, the decelerated already establishes a clawback by ratcheting back the credit based on the number of employees. So it's handled differently, the two aspects, employment and investment. So I, I think I understand that now. Did I just explain that correctly? Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't call it a clawback. Their credit yeah. is reduced right. if they have fewer employees, and they're only allowed to have that provision kick in in two out of the 20 years, the are two exception years, they can have lower levels of employment and get a reduced credit. But the other 18 years, they're going to have to have the standard level of employees in order to get a credit. Senator Chenette. So just to follow up, Julie, on that particular piece, if we play that out, if um, aside from the two exception years, if they don't meet those requirements, obviously we have the ratcheting down for the deceleration, but if they go to a certain point where there can be basically 0% or that where we do actually kick in the, the revocation, um, at that point we wouldn't basically be providing a tax break moving forward after that particular point. So th they'll basically have retain the tax break up until that time and then if they have gone beyond their two exception years after that point they, they they're not able to take advantage of the tax break okay thank you any other questions representative Grant. thank you um i thank mrs and um julie for walking us through that um in the interest of moving this along, um, I met with Julie and tried to come up with some additional language that I thought would move us forward on this. Um, somebody has just brought in these copies, and if I could ask the clerk, I'm, I'm putting forward something else for the committee's, committees. I hope it doesn't make things more complicated. Yeah. So that. If this isn't the time to discuss it, at least you'll have it on your desk. So mm -hmm. I'll leave that to the chair as to when we should discuss it.
Yes. Did you say you worked on it with Julie? I, I, I worked on this after I worked with Julie okay. on Friday. Okay. Um, and some of the questions that are being raised about the draft that Julie presented, I thought if we could look at some other proposed language, it might expedite it. Yeah. If that would be helpful to the committee. It would be. So, uh, All right, I, you'll have to point out where they are because yep. they're in. I, I don't see them, but I know they're there. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, me, let me walk you through this. This take, go, go ahead. Just to clarify, I think the changes that she is going to go through have a line on the side of the paper. Yep. Have a what? Uh, a line. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, if I may, uh, I'm proposing that item D, the exception year, that section be cut. In E, full time, in, in further discussions about what full time meant, um, I had thrown in the 36 hours um, definition, but there are people um, who are full time that work 32 hours. And um, so I'm proposing that that be changed to 32. F is the same. Um, as we move down through, um, let's see, to item three under H, qualified application, uh, applicant, excuse me, the 5,500 would change to 5,000. Did I get that right? I've gone over these numbers so many times that I start to get confused in my own mind, but no? 5,500 is what we want there? Yes. Okay, so that's not a change. No, I, let's circle that and come back to it. Um, <clears throat> on page three, we had some <clears throat> Questions about transferees. Let's see, I think I made some changes here as well. There, there's a line um, requiring it says, um, and it has the financial capacity to do so, and the commissioner determines that the investment employment criteria for the credit have been met period, instead of the, the language that's all on top of page four. If the commissioner grants a certificate of approval, the transferee must be treated um, as the certified applicant. So first, they, the, the, the commissioner has to um, determine that the transferee qualifies for the credit before it automatically goes forward. So that just gives a little check back. And down under limitations. So this would presume some of the um, semantics that, that MRS, you know, already walked through, tax, years. Some of the numbers would change here under limitations. So B, for the tax years beginning January 1st, the credit must be reduced pursuant to subsection 6 for any calendar year because we changed the exception year, we have to fix this, in which the certified applicant has employment of less than 5,500. And we're going to get to the, the new decelerated numbers that I'm going to propose. The pine tree zones piece is the same. And the accelerated credit. We're going to go down to the decelerated credit, and we're going to add two categories. 
help me if I'm um, if I'm confusing you here, but um, D and E. We're going to add F if a certification if a certified applicant has employment in exception year. Those exception year numbers will have to I think have to change because we eliminated the exception year. Um, we've added two categories. So that it doesn't drop, it drops from, originally we had it, it dropped from 60% of the credit down to zero. This added a 50% line and a 40% line as the, uh, if employment levels dropped. Julie, do you have a question? Well, I'm confused, I think. I mean, you've eliminated the um, definition of exception yep. year. Uh, but the exception year are the only years in which there is deceleration. So okay. if there are no exception years, then there's no deceleration. Okay. If you want to have a deceleration, then you need to yeah. okay. somehow or other we'll have to work on that. accommodate for that. <coughs> All right. But anyway, there are two categories added, and we can work on the language around that. The revocation section, um, I think MRS already deleted that second sentence anyway, um, so I think we're good there. Um, <coughs> additional requirements, wherever we put that, I, I don't have a problem wherever we decide to put that. All right, let me see here if I can. Clarifying question? Yep. Representative, so you're fine with uh, Section 8, or, yeah, Section 8 is moved by Julie earlier, remaining Section 8 additional requirements, yeah, and annual reporting requirement being Section 9 and all further sections. Go on, okay. And so I think um, page 6 is the same, but with um, the highlighted piece that MRS fixed. Page seven. The additional requirements piece, um, that was moved to another section anyway. We just talked about that earlier. And I think that's, now we come down to Here's, here's the kicker. Um, on the bottom of page seven, I'm, I'm proposing um, language that would strengthen the 10-year mark, and it would read, the Office of Program Evaluation and Government Accountability shall provide a report of its evaluation under this subsection to the Joint Standing Committee of the Legislature having jurisdiction over taxation matters by August 15, 2024. The committee, upon receipt of the report, will uh, will vote to authorize a further 10-year, $30 million credit. Should this vote not be in the affirmative, the committee shall report out a bill to the legislature approving the extension of the credit for a further 10 years and $30 million. Absent the enactment of this legislation, the credit sunsets on December 31st, 2028. Again, it also says, this subsection is intended only for purposes of legislative review and evaluation of the credit provided under this section. The subsection is not intended and may not be construed to create a private right of action by any person and may not be used to determine eligibility for preferential tax treatment. And that's in all the language per MRS. So I just present this um, to the committee. I'm, I'm open to people batting it around, but I just, I thought we could just start moving ahead on this and see where we could, we could go as a committee. And I'm, I appreciate your patience. I've worked on like three different drafts of this since I got here this morning. So if I sounded like I was um, stumbling over my words, it's just because I'm trying to make sure that I'm not making things more complicated. My intent was to make it a clean place to start. Representative Tapwa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just, I would like to ask uh, Representative Grant a question because as I'm looking at this again now, I'm, uh, I'm trying to decide the, what, what the substantive difference between your language and the gray language that um, Ms. Jones provided us 
in on page eight, well, they're both page eight, is um, in terms of the responsibilities of this committee um, and whether there really is a substantive difference between those two pieces. I can answer that question, Mr. Chair. Representative Tiffany. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I think this language is, uh, and Representative Grant, first off, thank you for uh, putting a lot of ideas in an amendment and um, working hard to make sure the details are not left behind. Um, I think the language proposed by Representative Grant is actually um, language that I requested. Uh, being th the biggest change here is that this would effectively have a sunset on the bill at the 10-year mark unless this committee takes a vote, a positive vote, to uh, enable it further or, barring that, an act of the legislature. Um, so uh, I, I believe this language is not that old. I think it's pretty new. And if the committee wants to um, uh, make sure that the intent of what I just said is mirrored in this language, um, I think that's what we should be doing right now. Uh, but the idea is um, this is not a free 20 years. Instead of just another report going on another shelf of another legislative committee, this committee has to take a vote, look at the numbers, and from all the testimony from her, we've heard um, from employees uh, to uh, the, the company talking about the number of uh, jobs that this investment will create. Um, if those numbers come through, then it will be a no-brainer for me um, to continue it. Um, if at that point there is a problem with the credit, if it needs to be tweaked, then new legislation can come forward and, and make those, those changes. <coughs> um, but this would require a positive vote of this committee to move forward for another 10 years. Representative Tapwa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a follow-up. Um, I'm just not sure that this language says that. I, I understand your point. Um, the committee upon receipt of the report will vote to authorize a further 10-year, $30 million credit. It sounds to me like there will be a positive vote upon the receipt of the report, yeah, which is, is not, I think, what you're trying to say here. You're trying to say that there will be a vote whether or not to authorize a further 10-year I, I believe, isn't that yeah. the intent? Yeah. Okay. And then in the next section, my understanding from what's written here is that should this committee decide not to authorize the next 10 years, that we must report a bill out mm -hmm. to the legislature to decide, to the entire legislature to decide to authorize um, as opposed to having a choice about whether or not to, uh, to send out such a bill if we choose not to reauthorize. A am I reading that language correctly again? I know that many of the people here realize we're deeply, deeply into the weeds, <laughs> but that is part of our job. <laughs> Um, yeah, now that I sort of read back that, that sentence, I sort of interpret it like Representative Tepler interprets it. Should this vote not be in the affirmative, the committee shall report out a bill to the legislature approving the extension of the credit. That's contradictory to me. To me, it should be the opposite. Or why do we need, if it automatically sunsets, if we don't do an affirmative vote, it automatically sunsets. There is no need for legislation at that point. Representative Cooper, still have a question? Um, that was basically my point. It makes no sense. Um, should this vote not be in the affirmative, in other words, if the committee rejects it, then they shall report to the legislature uh, a bill extending the credit. So that's contradictory, it, isn't it? 
the committee votes no to extend it. And if that happens, then we report a bill to the legislature uh, asking that it be extended for another 10 years. So either the, the decision is in the committee or it's in, it's in the full legislature. I thought the idea was to keep it in the committee, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm looking at some uh, dates that don't match up. Uh, the date on your sheet, Representative Grant, on page 8 for December 31st, 2028. That's assumes a 10-year period from January 1st of this year, I believe. And, and in the uh, yellow sheet on page 5, is it uh, somewhere, that's a... Uh, this all this all begins in the year 2020. Uh, page four. On yours, it'd be page eight, and you've got uh, sunsets on December 31st, 2028. I'm just looking at this inconsistency. Not that I agree with it, but. Uh, on page four in the yellow sheet, I call it the yellow sheet, uh, we have all this uh, qualified investments of $100 million on or after January 1st, 2020. So uh, I'm looking at an eight-year period instead of a 10, but... Uh, well, I, can I just try to answer your question? Uh, one refers to um, when the investment needs to be made by, I believe, the credit under three, and, and this is talking about when the legislative committee and then the full legislature, if necessary, would review, would be at the 10-year period. They have to make that investment um, mm -hmm. in that time frame, but this is dealing with our evaluation um, it requires an affirmative. My intention here, just to clarify, was that there would be a weigh-in by the full legislature, um, not just in this committee. The committee would receive the report, see if the um, if the purposes were set that are set out in the statute were met, and if so, the committee would then vo vote out a bill to approve the extension of that credit because it had met those statutory mm -hmm. requirements. And then, absent um, the enactment of this legislation, the, the, the sunsets, it sunsets in 2028, so the full legislature would then have a chance to weigh in. That, that I think, is what I was trying to say there. But okay. I'm open to other language. I think that where I'm trying to go with this is there are folks who don't want this credit to be just automatically 20 years. And we're trying to create some language here that would create an opportunity for this committee to take a look at the report to see if the credit in the first 10 years had lived up to its goals and its purpose. If it had done so, then um, it could be extended for the next 10 years. But it would have to have affirmative action by the legislature. That's what I'm trying to get at. And, and if I haven't captured that correctly, Representative Tipping, this was my attempt at trying to um, do what you asked it. So maybe you should um, tell me if I've got that wrong. Mr. Chair, may I clarify? Yeah, I just want to add a few comments before I do. I, I, uh, I look at this. I'm also looking at the yellow sheet on bottom of seven and eight where there's a uh, OPEGA review already. Mm -hmm. I'm of uh, the assumption that the legislature can uh, do anything they want to in any two-year period. If they want to throw the whole thing out, they can. Uh, the reason I like the 20 years is the nature of this business. Uh, when they, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that when you uh, bid on a contract, let's say you bid on one in the year 2027, 
and you get you win it you get the contract you might not start building that ship until 2032 five years later and so uh, when we get too short of periods of time I mean that's over that's past the 10-year period you see they've won the contract in the seventh year but they're building it in the twelfth year and yet they don't know if they're going to have the credit or not so that's why I like the 20th it's the nature of this business I wouldn't need it for mine but for a business like this that builds things uh, years in the future from the time they get the contract that's where I see the, the problem and so if you wanted to they'd almost have to come before the committee every five years to get a 10-year extension so that they could go out 10 years every single time and you'd have to do that five years in advance so that they keep it be like a contract that principals get sometimes they get a three-year contract at the end of uh, one year or sometimes two years they get an extension and they they give them another three years It doesn't go on top of what they've got already, but they've only got two years left And so they're automatically given a three-year contract. So I, I look at the I have to look at the time levels <coughs> according to the type of business it is and I don't think a 10-year one would necessarily work in the benefit of bath iron works uh, unless we renewed every five years and saying okay you get another 10 years five years later okay get another 10 years so that we don't bid and not be able to build the ship in the same time period that the credit law covers Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think there's a couple uh, points of clarification that I needed here. Um, section nine, uh, page seven of the uh, original version we were just presented, most of that is still here, the dark gray part, um, including the date of the report. Uh, so you were just talking about five years. This one comes in at, at six years, four years before uh, the, um, the sunset of the credit. So a uh, four-year, five-year, I mean, uh, we, we can talk about that. Uh, but the idea is uh, the same language around the OPEGA report is still there. Uh, and the review and the action by this committee would be prompted by that 2024 report. Um, and just to clarify, I think uh, I, some of this language might need to be tweaked. Um, but the idea is if this committee does not have a positive vote and we can add whether or not um, uh, in there, uh, if this committee does not have a positive vote, that bill uh, reported out of this committee would be going back to the drawing board, I, I, in my mind. Um, if this bill needed to be tweaked, needed to be, make sure that there were uh, new clawbacks uh, or uh, clear distinctions around job numbers needed or, or you know, whatever, um, uh, if this committee voted not to go forward with current language for another 10 years, that would trigger the reporting out of a bill for this committee to then go back to the drawing board and look at the whole issue again. Um, so I think that's how I read that language. And it, it, um, and that's, I think, verbally what I said would um, that move towards this language. If that's not clear, um, let's work to make it clear. Representative Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would suggest um, this, that uh, we go back to the language that's in the version with the yellow stuff on it. I think it's simpler. Um, I, I, as I said earlier, I think um, some of this language is contradictory um, in the new version. I do believe that there ought to be a point where the committee evaluates the effectiveness of the tax incentive um, 
And uh, I, I certainly agree with the uh, chair's um, uh, position that shipbuilding is a, is a different uh, ball of wax from many other kinds of uh, industries. But that is a that is a factor that the, this committee can take into consideration, and the and the and the legislature as, as a whole can take into consideration that they're in the midst of contracts that have been um, gained through uh, the, uh, the benefit of having the tax incentive, and to to end it at that point would be counterproductive. So it's not like uh, you know we're going to be doing this in a vacuum. Um, but without uh, a pause button, um, there's no uh, legislative um, review or evaluation of whether or not this credit is doing its job over a long, fairly long period of time, 20 years. And I'd also suggest that ha instead of uh, having o OPEGA issue its report in 2024, that it be 2028 because that's the midway point, and that's when the legislature uh, and the committee should be uh, making a judgment about whether uh, it should be continued. So, to sum up, I would suggest the language in the bill, uh, the uh, the uh, amendment uh, that has the yellow markings, uh, starting on page 7, continuing on page 8, um, and leaving it as is, except changing 2024 to 2028, and uh, spelling joint correctly. Uh, ask a question about the message. Yeah. Representative Cooper. Uh, so, Representative Cooper, uh, that is much weaker language, just to be clear. That is allowing 20 years, no existential intervention by the committee, uh, no triggered evaluation upon which the future of the credit goes. All that does is allow 20 years, and then it gives the committee the option of intervening at any time, which the committee has by virtue of our current tax expenditure review well, process. 2028 is 10 years, and 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 then and that's when we get the report, and that's when we have to uh, submit a bill to the legislature. That's not letting it go 20 years. It's it's a 10-year marker. But the old language has a sunset of. 2038, and I want to be clear about that. The language that you just moved, we adopt. Well, not in this section. Well, but maybe it doesn't. It doesn't change the other part of the law. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to be clear. Okay, but if that's the case, then I, this language in the new, in the latest version, uh, Representative Grant's uh, amendment uh, has. I, I I still read this as as having contradictory uh, sentences. Should this vote not be in the affirmative, uh, in other words, should we reject it, uh, then we report a bill uh, to the legislature approving the extension for a further 10 years. I mean, that makes no sense. Representative Pouliot. Thanks. Um, so what does make sense to me is the bill that we were presented by Julie, along with uh, some tweaks that were presented by Representative Grant. The 32-hour-a-week uh, piece I'm fine with, making that change. Um, I also think that we should have a discussion about the deceleration. I think that we should keep the exception year in, but allow for the deceleration uh, numbers that occurred. I I'm fine with leaving them the way that they're presented in this bill, with the bottom being 4,500. But I'd like to know from Representative Grant where the where the 4,000 came about. Um, and otherwise, you know, I think that the 10-year uh, review period or a review period should should occur. But I'm not okay uh, with with sunsetting this in, in 10 years. So I wouldn't support that aspect of this change, but I do appreciate you bringing forward these these changes so that we can have a discussion about it. Um, and I would be curious to know about the 4,000 number and the deceleration clause. There, Julie, I need clarification on uh, our date. We have a, a starting date of I see 2020, January 1st. 
And then we have some language in here. I keep looking for it, but I'm missing it. Has to do with uh, the hundred million dollar investment. If it's not done within a certain period of time, I was thinking that was five years, but I'm still. I think looking. you want to look at uh, subsection three on page four. Um, subsection three, paragraph A and B. A provides that the first round of investment. The first $100 million investment, um, well, the credit applies to the first round of investment, uh, which can be made before or after, I suppose, January mm -hmm. 1st, 2020. I mean, I, the, what the bill envisions, I think, is that first round of $100 million would be made probably by 2020, mm -hmm. um, and that the um, shipbuilding facility would be entitled to a credit based upon that investment for nine, for nine additional, for, for 10 years. Um, paragraph B provides that if they make an additional $100 million of investment by January 1st of 2025, is, yeah. that they then get another 10 years beyond so the if. first 10 years. So if they, if they make the investment, so that would be the second $100 million investment <coughs> by 2025. Yes. So they would have to make that investment by 2025. If they don't make that investment by 2025, then there's only 10 years of credit. There's only 10 years anyway. So yes. what's the point of the date for the OPEGA review? Well, I think that the 2024 date was chosen because it seems to be on the transition point um, before that um, investment needing to be made in 2025. Mm -hmm. In but order to the qualify report, for the second round. So the, would, the report would just say, yes, they've made their hundred, first $100 million investment. It wouldn't necessarily say they're automatically going to make the, the second $100 million, because if they don't, the program ends anyway, the credit program. I think that was the idea. I think the timing is probably a little bit awkward for the company, given that their planning um, process requires long timelines. Um, I think the idea was that there should be some period of time for the legislature to be able to come in and say there's not that second round of, of, of credit anymore. and. Um, but I, I don't know whether that, how that relates to the company's decision of whether to make that second round of investment in order to qualify for the second round of credit. Um, I'm just, I guess I'm wondering whether the 2024 date should stay where it is or be moved to the other side of 2025. That's what I'm wondering about. Uh, Representative Tapler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I think I would support the 2024 date um, and because I think it does give the company a fair amount of time for planning um, and um, it gives a good opportunity for the legislature to respond. Um, I have a suggestion that I'm willing to run by everybody in terms of the language that we've talked about, um, if I may, or if I, if you want, I will hold it until we finish the discussion about the date. Representative Grant. I think we could move that August 15th, 2024 to 2027, and that would be um, the year before the 10-year <coughs> reauthorization. And that way, OPEGA will have done its, um, its work have its report by 2027, and then um, that would give the committee, that would be the ninth year, if my math is correct, um, that, would, that would give us time, that would give the committee uh, a time to review it. That would be my suggestion, 2027. Yeah. 
by then the company's already made two hundred million dollar investments. Yeah. Representative Tapla, excuse me, tipping. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You, you said what I was going to say. I mean, I think the 2024 date was meant to make changes before the company was in that process of making that second yeah. expenditure. Okay. Um, uh, you know, it's worth noting that we're here in 2018 and the credit's already expired. Um, but uh, I think it would be, I mean, again, I, I would push for that, you know, triggered existential review uh, where we get the information and then this committee has to make a positive choice to continue. Um, and I think if that happens in response to a 2024 report, that gives the company notice that if it's not working out, you know, um, they have a chance to uh, either work again with this committee to build a new bill, uh, but they're not making a $100 million investment based on a $3 million return over the next two years, uh, 10 years um, that, that might not be there. <coughs> so, again, I, I would support that. Representative Grant. Julie, just to confirm, that, that date of August 15th, 2024, that we had in there originally was suggested by OPEGA, was it not? I mean, I, I would defer I, to them as to when they win, needed to do the evaluation to, in order to ascertain whether this program is meeting its, its purposes and goals. I don't recall where, this, where that date, who, I, I don't recall whose suggestion the date was. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I can't support the 10 year dates, not the nature of this company, the type of company it is. I think it's uh, uh, close to economic suicide. So, <laughs> Representative Tepler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to make a suggestion as far as all this language and the 10 years go, and we'll see how that, how that rides with the whole committee. Um, I was in mentally sticking with the uh, 2024 date um, because that was the date Opega gave and because it gave some planning timelines. Um, but upon receipt of the report, the committee will vote whether or not to authorize a further 10-year credit. And that would say that if the committee votes to authorize a further 10-year credit, that is the end of the matter. The, the credit continues based solely on the committee vote. However, if the vote is not in the affirmative, the committee shall submit a bill to the next session of the 130 seconds to accomplish its recommendation. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully splitting hairs and coming to some kind of, of compromise here, but, but I'm not sure. So I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah, I don't see it as a compromise because if you do it, do it 2024, it, it doesn't matter. They get a ship, they get a bid on in 2022, and it's not going to be built until 2027. And so they're going to bid under the assumption, what are they going to build under? The assumption that they've got no tax credit or the assumption that they do have one and then they and may not end up with one. So that's, how I, that's why I said to me it's economic suicide. Mr. Chair, I guess I'm confused. If, if we have a fair amount of surety that the company will abide by the standards that we're providing for them to, um, to receive taxpayer money to help with economic development, um, then I'm not sure why there would be any issue at all. Representative Hilliard. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Tepl, I appreciate your willingness to move this forward, but I think you're, we're taking a company that's willing to invest $200 million and we're really handcuffing them into a really short period of time when they're in an industry, as Senator Dow says, that 
really plans out over several years, both on the expense side and the income side. So I'm not in favor of anything that shortens up that 20-year period. <clears throat> Thank you. Representative Hilliard. Is there any further discussion? Uh, Senator Dow had to step out, um, so why don't we take a five-minute recess and then come back here in five minutes. <laughs> this is not a one o'clock means 2.15 thing, okay? I'm